Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Marlene Sotelo. I'm the program director of the Ells for Autism Foundation in the United States. And we are really excited to be launching our e-team e-learning series with the understanding and nature of autism spectrum disorder. We're really happy to see our uh, colleagues from Johannesburg, from our center there, joining us. So welcome, Alex and Shani. And we welcome um, those others who have uh, joined us at this session. We will re be recording all of our live webinars. So if you know of someone that wasn't able to make it, uh, please know that we will be publishing the recording links so that everyone can access it at a later date. Um, if you notice at the bottom next to the chat box, there is a box that says files to. If you click on the word autism 101 file, you are able to then download the slides from today's presentation. And that way you can have a copy of the presentation along with the recording as well. So what we'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, provide the presentation and then I'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for question and answer. If there's something really pressing that you would like to ask, feel free to type it into the chat box and I'll do my best to be able to glance down as often as possible to be able to um, see your question and be able to answer. And if not, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and just wait till the end and I'll leave some time for you to be able to ask some questions. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So what is autism spectrum disorder? Now, there's there are a lot of confusion now because up until uh, 2013, um, really the autism spectrum disorder was a, an umbrella of five different diagnoses. Uh, but what we do know is that autism is a complex brain disorder and it's often diagnosed around two years of age. Now, unfortunately, in many parts of the world and even here in the United States, uh, there are children that aren't being diagnosed till three, four, and five. And for those who are on the higher end of the autism spectrum, they may not be diagnosed till even later in life. They may be diagnosed with something, um, some other diagnosis, maybe attention deficit disorder um, or some other type of uh, disorder. And then later, when they're seen by a trained uh, diagnostician, they are actually correctly diagnosed with, with autism. Um, within the autism spectrum, we see very specific characteristics associated with deficiencies in the areas of social skills, communication, and behavior across the, lifetime, across the lifetime. And that really is one of the key factors is that these deficits are seen across the lifespan. They may change over time with intervention, but they are pervasive in affecting those areas for the individual. And it is considered to be a spectrum. And what that means is that there are a wide range of abilities within the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. So you may have individuals that have some good communication skills, but they may not um, have effective pragmatic skills where they're able to use communication and their words to be able to effectively um, uh, have a conversation with others. Or you may have some that are very social, they want to interact with others, um, but may not do, do it effectively. And there are those who may not have any words and may completely isolate themselves. So within the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, we have a very wide range of abilities. Um, and that's why it's called autism spectrum disorder. So as I mentioned previously, in the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the autism spectrum disorder fell under what's called pervasive developmental disorders. And there were uh, various diagnoses that fell under. Um, there was childhood disintegrative disorder, autistic disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, non otherwise specified, and Asperger's disorder. And prior to the DSM-IV, there was also Rett syndrome that, was, um, that fell under uh, PDD, uh, and then it was changed to just these four disorders. So in 2013, the DSM-5 was published. And with this publication, there was the change from overall perv pervasive developmental disorder to a specific diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. So there are no longer any separate diagnoses within the spectrum. So everyone gets the diagnosis of ASD. 
Um, so anyone who previously was diagnosed with any of the other disorders listed under the umbrella would still now today be given the diagnosis of ASD. So what happened? When this new classification um, came to be, it, it really caused a lot of confusion with what the term PDD really meant. Um, there was also a lack of reliability in differentiating between the four disorders. And so therefore, um, we're still under the process of he helping the community to understand what the new diagnostic criteria is and how do the other disorders that were previously under the umbrella, how do they fa fall within the new diagnostic criteria? So how common is ASD? So the prevalence numbers that we are going to rely on are those from the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. We know that there are varying numbers across the world. And in some places, we really don't even know specifically what the prevalence is because there hasn't been a prevalence study. So within the um, United States, the prevalence numbers are currently one in 68. And that was from the Center for Disease Control published last year in 2014. So in 2008, it was one in 88. One thing that has been consistent is that we know that boys are almost five times more likely than girls to have autism spectrum disorder. Um, and that has been um, consistent even when the rates were, were um, less. I often get the question of, you know, why do I think that the rates have changed? Um, is it because uh, there are toxins in, in the air or is it because there are better uh, diagnostics yet? But we, we do know that we have better awareness of what the signs are. We have stronger instruments to be able to assess and determine if a child falls under the spectrum. We are learning um, much earlier if a child falls in the spectrum or not. And there, there are some possibilities that their environment is also impacting the higher rates of autism. So we're gonna talk in a minute about what might be the cause of autism. Uh, so mostly children uh, weren't diagnosed until after age of five um, in the past, after age of four and five, but we are seeing children being diagnosed as early as two years old. And some with a very keen eye are able to diagnose even earlier than that. And one of the things regarding diagnoses of autism is that it impacts all racial, ethnic, and social classes. And about one in 63 are white children, one in 81 are black children, and one in 93 are Hispanic children uh, within the prevalence study that was conducted by the Centers for Disease Control. So what causes ASD? We really don't know. We don't know yet. Um, a lot of research is taking place in order for us to determine what is the cause. Um, but what we have found out is that it's likely a variety of possibilities that cause um, autism spectrum disorder. And these factors include genetic, biological, and environmental factors. Um, so factors associated with genes include those that are inherited genes from the genetic makeup of the parents or spontaneous genetic mutations um, or copying errors where many different genes are implicated. And now in the case of twins, if one twin has autism, the other will most likely be affected between 36 to 95% of the time for identical twins and about zero to 31% of the time for non-identical twins. Another factor that plays in the diagnostic uh, diagnosis of autism includes the maternal and paternal age. And so there is some link to the diagnosis of autism depending on the age of the parents. So specifically, if the mother is over the age of 35 and if the father is over the age of 40. So we are finding some patterns that will help us to understand what are the most common causes or what are the uh, risk factors for autism really because we don't know what the causes are. So let's look at what are some of the associated characteristics. Um, there are a lot of individuals with autism that have seizures. About 20 to 25% of individuals with autism will develop seizures. Um, they have varying IQs. So we have individuals on the autism spectrum that have above average 
IQs that may have uh, may be gifted. And then there are individuals on the autism spectrum that um, have a cognitive delay that would be considered intellectually disabled. And there are varying IQ scores with almost half, about 46% have average or above average IQ. And 10% have what we call co-occurring psychiatric diagnosis. So what that means is the primary diagnosis may be autism, but in addition, they, the individuals may have a psychiatric diagnosis such as depression and anxiety. Um, in addition to the medical comorbid uh, diagnosis, many individuals with autism also have learning challenges. So we see distractibility, uh, they have organizational difficulties and difficulties with generalization of skills. So we'll see that we teach the child certain skills during individual therapy or the child learns skills in the classroom. And then when they go into a different setting or when they're with other people, they're unable to demonstrate that information that they so readily learned and so readily exhibited in a particular setting. So when we're working with individuals on the spectrum, it's essential that we plan um, for generalization. And we do that by providing many different examples of what we're teaching. We teach those examples in a variety of environments. And whenever possible, we include different people in instruction. So one of the easiest ways to do this is to transfer learning to the home environment. In involving parents in the intervention is key to really making an impact in the progress of the child because now the parent is the facilitator of instruction and the instruction is taking place in the home, so another environment, and using different materials. So now the child is able to generalize that knowledge to different people, places, and uh, materials. Another associated characteristic is behavior problems. And behavior problems come in a variety of forms. Uh, oftentimes, we see behavior problems associated with the inability to communicate. We know that communication is behavior. And if an individual is challenged in being able to get their needs met, in being able to share experiences with others through words, they are going to exhibit behavioral challenges. And so it's not that autism causes behavior problems, it's because of the frustration that the individual has in um, not being able to connect with others and not being able to communicate effectively that leads the indiv individual to develop challenging behaviors. In addition, we know that individuals with autism have sensory challenges. Their perception of sensory input is very different from other people. They may see things differently. Their responses to sound and taste um, and touch is different. And so the way that they respond to it may, may be in a, a behavioral way that is not necessarily the most appropriate for the situation um, or the most effective for the situation. And so we work to be able to um, assist them in managing those types of sensory situations. Um, okay. So how do we diagnose autism? Uh, currently, there is no medical test to determine whether an individual has autism or not. The only way to diagnose autism is based on the observation of that individual, um, on their behaviors, and also through interviewing of the caregivers. So the neurologist, uh, the child might be seen by the neurologist, and the neurologist will observe the child, interact with the child, um, and ask the parent or caregiver many different questions to determine how the child has been developing, have they reached a variety of milestones, when did they start talking, do they point, do they communicate with gesture, gestures, and through those uh, questions and through the direct observation, we are able to determine whether or not the child um, meets the criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. Um, in addition to the neurologist, there may be uh, a, psych a psychologist that will do a variety of tests to determine if the child has autism. And these tests are really psychoeducational tests. For example, um, the ADOS uh, will be one instrument that um, the facilitator that has been trained in that tool 
will work with the child, will also interview the parent or caregiver and um, gather sufficient information to determine what level of autism that child has. So for some children, autism can de be de uh, detected as early as 18 months. And it actually can be diagnosed reliably at the age of two with an experienced diagnosti diagnostician. Now there is no cure for autism. Uh, autism is not a disease and so we're, we're not here to cure it. What we do know is that with early intervention and with evidence-based interventions um, and treatments, children with autism can learn to communicate, can learn to navigate the social world, can effectively engage in uh, meaningful social communication. And the key is really early intervention. That doesn't mean that if that individual did not receive early intervention, that they are not going to make gains. But the patterns of behavior and the patterns of learning are set as the child is exploring their world when they're younger, they're gaining information from their environment. And so the sooner we're able to get in and um, be able to um, change the pathways of learning and sh change the interactions and the shared experiences that they have with the social world, the greater the gains that that individual is going to make. So even if we don't start intervention until the individual is eight or nine, that does not mean that that individual will not progress. We may have to do more intensive intervention and have more creative ways of intervening, um, but it's never too late. So what are the, the main areas that are affected? Previously, in the original diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, where it fell under pervasive developmental disorder, there were three areas of um, that were three areas that were affected. There was social, there was communication, and there were restricted and repetitive behaviors. With the new diagnostic criteria, what they did is they put together in one category social communication and interaction. The reason is that really the way we socialize is through communication. It's nonverbal communication, facial and body expression. It's with our words. And, and so therefore, they go hand in hand. Socialization goes with communication. And when we communicate, we are interacting with the social world. So that collapsed into one category. The next category um, under autism spectrum disorder is restricted and repetitive behaviors. So the repetitive behaviors may include things such as uh, repetitive vocalizations, uh, clicking sounds with the mouth. It could be repetitive uh, motor movements. So it could be flicking of fingers in the face or flapping. It could be rocking. Uh, many of us engage in a lot of repetitive behaviors and we don't have a diagnosis of autism. We may shake our leg repeatedly or, or we may twirl our hair during a presentation. Uh, but it doesn't disconnect us from the social world. It doesn't, we know when we should be engaging in that behavior, when we shouldn't. And it doesn't impact our learning and our engagement with others. Um, the same thing with restricted range of interest. Many of us have interests in very specific things. Uh, that's what makes us unique. We have hobbies, we have areas of expertise. But when that restricted interest impacts our ability to navigate the social world, to engage with others and formulate relationships, it becomes an issue that can lead to deficiencies in learning and in social interactions. And so that's the other category that is involved in autism spectrum disorder. And we're gonna go through this in more detail now. So what is, what is involved in social interaction and communication challenges? Um, there often is little sharing of pleasure interests and achievements with others. And let me, let me stop for a moment and say that these are general statements of, of behaviors or characteristics that we might see in individuals with autism. That doesn't mean that every person with autism has all of these elements that I'm sharing with you here. These are examples of, of characteristics that we see in individuals in the category of social interaction and communication. So it's not like every person with autism doesn't like to share pleasurable experiences or interests, but that might be something that we do see. 
Uh, we also will often see a difficulty with the back and forth of a conversation. So we might engage in conversation with um, an individual with autism, but it's more of a one-way street. So that person may be more interested in, in talking about their area of interest instead of engaging in the back and forth conversation where I share a little bit about what I like and I wait for you to respond. And then I respond to you and you respond to me. And that give and take is sometimes missing in individuals on the spectrum. There may be limited or lack of eye contact. And that's one of the, uh, one of the red flags that we often see with younger children that they're, they're, they may not be engaging in eye contact with their parent or they may not respond to their name. Now, what we do see sometimes is that the individuals may engage in eye contact, but inappropriate eye contact. And in my 20 years of experience in working with people with autism, what I found is that that occurs a great deal in individuals that have been over taught to, um, to look into people's eyes, right? So we don't stare at someone the entire time we're talking to them. We look away, uh, we can maybe look up. Our eyes share expression and thought and feeling. And so when we just stare straight at the person, that's also not um, a norm and common for interaction. So you could see someone that has limited or lack of eye contact or on the other end where they have exaggerated eye contact. Uh, we also see that these individuals have difficulty understanding nonverbal information like facial expressions. So, so much of what we communicate with others involves our facial expression. So although I don't like to see myself on camera right now, I share with you my, my webcam because I think that my message is shared much better if you're able to see my face. You, you understand my emotion, you understand my engagement. I, I, the funny thing is I actually have a post-it note covering my screen because I don't like to look at myself, um, but I like my audience to be able to see me. I also use a lot of hand gestures and my hand gestures are my way of emphasizing certain points that I'm trying to say and I use gestures to reel in the listener. And so an individual with autism may not pick up on those facial cues, especially if they're not looking at you. If they're looking at another part of your body or they're looking to the side, they're missing so much of the communication that's coming from the body language and from the facial expressions. They also might um, have delayed a delay in developing gestures. So one of the things that we teach very early on is to point because individuals with autism, little, little kids, um, they may not point. They might grab you by the hand to take you to what they want. They may, they may just reach their hand out. Um, they may just look at the thing that they want, but they don't point. And pointing is a form of communicating. Gestures such as this give me, you know what this means. Um, you know what a uh, facial expression with my hands out like that might mean. So gestures in combination with a, with a spoken word is often deficient in individuals with autism, um, especially early on. They might also have uh, difficulty in combining uh, nonverbal behaviors along with their communication, so eye contact with gestures. And we also might see what we call echolalia. And echolalia is when the individual repeats what is said. So I say, um, hi, Marlene, uh, or hi, Shani. And instead of Shani saying, hi, Marlene, I say, hi, Shani. And she says, hi, Shani. So she's echoing what I say. There also might be delayed echolalia, where I say, hi, Shani, and Shani doesn't say anything. But an hour later, Shani's saying, hi, Shani. Or she might also be uh, scripting what she's heard on TV or scripting uh, what other people have said. Uh, that she's heard in the past. Uh, we also see uh, challenges in the area of peer relationships and play. And this still falls under that one category of um, areas that are affected for social communication. So they may not be able to um, imitate simple household routines or imitate um, uh, fine motor and gross motor uh, behaviors. They may have difficulty in complex pretend play. So playing house, pretending to be teacher, or like this little boy here, pretending to be a carpenter. They may have trouble sharing or taking turns and working collaboratively. 
And some people ask me, well, why, why is it that they have trouble sharing? And why, why wouldn't they want to be able to engage with others? And one thing we know is that individuals with autism have challenge with perspective taking. So right now, I, if you were here with me and I was giving a live lecture, I would be gauging your responses to understand what your perspective is of my presentation. If I didn't, right now I have no idea what your perspective is, so I just go on and on and I talk and talk and I think that you like what I'm saying, but I really don't have any idea. But I know that my audience has their own perception of what I'm saying and what I'm doing. So it's understanding that others have thoughts of their own and desires and, um, and feelings. So if I don't understand perspective taking, then I want all my toys. I want, I want to only have my turn because the world is mine because I only have my perspective. So one thing that we do in our intervention is to, is to teach individuals with autism to understand the perspective of others. That maybe, maybe you don't really like uh, scary movies. They really like scary movies and it's okay that I don't like scary movies also. Um, maybe I want that toy as well. And so it will make me happy if you share with me and we help them to understand um, what others might be thinking um, or feeling. Uh, they might seem um, oblivious to others and or uninterested in other children. Again, if they don't understand perspective taking, if they have a difficulty with understanding that others have their own perspective, they may not be aware of others. They also may be very focused on their area of interest. So if they really like an iPad, all they see is that iPad. They only want to play with the iPad because they don't think that this other person has thoughts and ideas about the iPad as well. And so I'm completely immersed in my world with my perspective and my desires. So it's not that they don't care and they don't want to, it's that that's the way that their brain may be wired to only um, be aware of their own needs and their own perspective. And they may all seem to prefer solitary activities instead of engaging with others. Um, and they may have trouble making friends. If you can imagine all of these, all of these items that I've just reviewed with you, if, if I don't take turns, if I don't share my toys, if I only talk about things that I like and I don't let you have a chance to share what you like, it's going to be tr troubling. It's going to be challenging to, to make friends because somebody might want to be friends with me, but after a couple times of hanging out with me, they may not want to be with me anymore because I'm not following the social rules of turn taking and sharing and uh, conversing. So it's not that they don't want to make friends. And, want, and they want to be alone, it's that it's challenging for them. And so it's our role as interventionists to teach them the skills that will help them to make friendships and to keep those friendships. Some behavioral challenges. You can see here the cars lined up. And that's um, one, of the, one of the early signs that parents come and tell us. Um, they say, you know, my child might not be talking. They don't respond to their name. They um, are fixated on the fan or they flick the lights on and off and they seem to line everything up. And not only do they line it up, but when I try and take one of the cars out of the line, they become very upset and dysregulated. So these are some of the uh, behavioral red flags that we might see. They might have some repetitive and unusual uh, use of language, such as um, scripted type of speech and their tone of voice might be uh, very robotic. They might have some unusual motor mannerisms. Uh, we often see that they have strong reactions to small changes in the environment or routines. And I, I really can understand these, some, some of these things such as uh, changes in the environment. If, just imagine to yourself, you move to a new house. You move to a new house and you move to a new city and you get a new job. Imagine how anxiety ridden you become with all of these changes in your life. But you have the social world to pull from. You have friends, you have family, you have the spoken word to be able to communicate with others what you're feeling. In addition, you have sensory uh, regulation. You're able to understand what you're feeling 
that anxiety and you're able to control it or do things to calm yourself down. So when you don't have those coping skills, when you don't have the social support, when you are lacking in communication skills, changes in your routine and changes in your life can be monumental. And so therefore it's important for us and as interventionists, as parents, uh, for, for if any of you are out there, are parents of children with autism, it's very important for you to help these individuals to prepare for changes um, in their life, changes in the environment. And that's not to say that we have to make the world a bubble and make the world perfect and never allow the child or the individual with autism to experience change because that's not gonna help either. Uh, we can't set them up for failure because when they leave our house, when they leave our center, they're gonna experience change and have a meltdown. But we can, as much as possible, prepare them for change. And in addition, we can teach them coping skills. We can give them communication systems to be able to request help or to request more information. Um, and that way we will reduce the likelihood of these behavioral challenges. Um, we also see that these individuals may um, use uh, objects in a repetitive way. Uh, so you might see them use, um, one of the kids I worked with, he loved hangers. And so he, he loved to make them flick like this. And I realized what he really liked was the sound that the hanger, because it had to be plastic hangers, he liked what the sound of the plastic hangers made. And so he would listen, 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 and he would just love that. I have another boy that I currently work with, and he loves um, um, plastic bottles of water, but they can't be totally filled. They have to be slightly filled, and he loves to tap them and hear the crunchy sound of the plastic with the water swishing. Um, so we might see these types of repetitive behaviors. We might also see um, uh, play with toys in, in a way that the toy wasn't meant to be. So instead of going vroom, vroom with the car, the child may be repeatedly uh, moving the car back and forth, looking at the wheel and how the wheel is moving uh, around and around and the car is going back and forth. Uh, we also will see some highly restricted and fixated interest. And this could be a challenge, but as an educator, to me, this can also be a great motivator. So we can use the restricted interest and the fixated the fixations to teach other skills, to motivate them to engage in activities that are not necessarily preferred. And we can use those restricted interests to start channel channeling that individual for a potential job in that area of interest. So if you have someone who really loves dinosaurs and is, is so much into history, and I'm thinking of, of these wonderful people that I've worked with before and have liked dinosaurs, have a fixation with history. What a wonderful tour guide in a museum, um, in the Museum of Science, to be able to um, share their knowledge and their passion with others. Uh, so we use these fixations, these restricted interests to be able to um, maximize their abilities and to really explore employment opportunities in the future. Um, they also might engage in, in meltdowns or display self-injurious behaviors. And um, this would probably be a whole, other, uh, a whole other webinar, but the difference between meltdowns and tantrums. And a meltdown is very different from a tantrum because a tantrum, the child is aware of what they are doing in order to get something. So they're either tantruming in order to escape something or tantruming to gain access to something, whether it's to attention or to an object. And so, and the tantrum may look like, um, you know, throwing your shoes across the room or hitting, or maybe it's just screaming and crying and throwing yourself on the floor. The meltdown is something that the individual cannot control. The meltdown is a response to overstimulation in the environment, whether it's a verbal stimulation, a sensory stimulation of light, um, sound, uh, things that they um, see or feel or those changes in routine that happen very quickly and unexpected where they are in, unable to regulate themselves. So you can imagine that the way that you respond to a tantrum would be very different than how you respond to a meltdown because a tantrum, you, given the right instruction, that child will learn that the tantrums don't work. But given a meltdown, if you respond to the meltdown like a tantrum, the child is probably gonna 
go deeper into the meltdown and have more of a behavioral response. Um, and the meltdown could last for an extended period of time. Um, the other behavioral challenge that we might see is that they might repeat things incessantly. So they have a perseveration on certain things. And so they, they often will perseverate on things that are related to the areas of interest. Um, or they may be per, uh, per, uh, perseverating, sorry, uh, they may be perseverating on something that's coming up. So for example, uh, you may have a child that is getting ready to go on a vacation. They're going to go to grandma's house for the holidays. And you've told them in preparation, we're going to go to grandma's house for the holidays. We're going to spend the weekend and we're going to go on a plane to get there. But now every day is when are we going to grandma's? Are we going to grandma's today? And they, they are stuck in trying to gain information about this event that's going to take place. And there are things that we can do to assist that individual in not getting stuck on that wheel of asking the same question and wanting that information. So we use certain strategies such as calendars. We use social stories or social narratives um, to prepare them. Uh, we've also, um, I've done it with, with several clients that I work with where they want to talk about the same thing all the time. And so we, we say, okay, you have four chances today to talk about, uh, about grandma coming to visit. Once those four chances are, we're going to talk about something else. And so you can either do it with just little check marks or you can give grandma, talk about grandma tickets. Once those tickets are up, we're going to talk about something else. And when you structure things for these individuals and give them guidelines, uh, in my experience, it has been very effective. Um, and again, when I give you these examples of ways to inter intervene, um, interventions, they work for some people, others, they don't. And that's why working um, as, as a specialist in this field is a challenge, but at the same, it challenge in, in the sense that we have to be creative. We have to have a toolbox of so many different interventions and be really um, on top of things as to what's going to work for one person and what's going to work for the other. We do know what the evidence-based practices are and what the research has shown us is most effective. But they're, you're going to come across an individual who's completely different and that toolbox doesn't work. So you have to be ready to go back in to the drawing board and find some new and inventive strategies for them. I always say if something's not working, it's not because of the person with autism. It's my fault. I'm the one who has not been able to figure out the most effective strategy to help this person to learn. So I, I, I know it's not their fault. It's me as a teacher. And um, so I, even after 20 years, still work very diligently to put more tools in my toolbox. All right, so sensory processing. Uh, we, just so you know, part of our series, we will have one specifically on communication. That's tomorrow. We also, our, our next one in, our, um, um, I forgot the date now, I apologize. I believe it's at the end of the month, is going to be on behavior. And we also are going to be having one on sensory processing in December. So we are trying to touch upon all the areas that we're um, talking about today in the overview. So just a little bit of information regarding sensory processing. Um, it is unusual reactions to the way things sound, smell, taste, uh, look, or feel. I've had some people who suffer from migraines that tell me that they have, um, when they do have migraines, they have a very keen sen um, sense of smell um, and that also sounds are very um, impactful to them. And I always think that maybe that's similar to what individuals with autism feel. And I've had the, the honor of working with adults that are on the higher end of the autism spectrum and have been able to share with me their experiences of, of their sensory responses and how things taste odd to them. Um, they, they may smell things differently or may, they may not smell um, things that we smell. So we, again, being that autism is a spectrum, we see individuals that are hyposensitive or hypersensitive. So we have kids that they fall, they come home with a bruise and no one even saw them cry they never responded. No one even knows how it happened because they didn't feel the pain. While we have others that you just grab their hand to take them somewhere and, it, and they respond as if it's painful. Uh, we might also see um, excessive smelling. They wanna smell different things. 
They might be licking things or, or touching objects. They want to touch everything as they go by. Some may demonstrate a fixation on lights or movement of objects. And we often see individuals with autism that have some eating challenges. They may be picky eaters. Um, I've worked with some individuals that only want to eat things that are orange, or they'll only eat chicken nuggets that are from one type of company, and they'll only eat macaroni and cheese, and that's it. That's all they'll eat. Or others that any kind of texture that is, is kind of like rice or anything with little bumps, they can't even deal with it. Uh, so uh, it becomes challenging to get the proper nutrients in some of the individuals uh, because of their picky, picky eating challenges. In regards to expressive language, what we see is that we have a wide range of abilities in regards to language. Some individuals might be completely nonverbal, and so they don't produce any words. They might have sounds, um, but not, not any, um, any specific words or word approximations, or they might be minimal, minimally verbal, where they might have just about five to 10 words that they're able to utilize. Um, others are very proficient with their vocabulary, and in fact, some of them, uh, they might be considered like a little Einstein because they have so many words in their, in their repertoire that are not commonly seen in children that age. Uh, so what happens is, is that they have all of this vocabulary, but it's not, it's not used in an appropriate manner. And so their pragmatics, the use of language to communicate with others um, in a social situation is impacted. They may seem overly formal um, or they might have difficulty with um, interpreting figures of speech or idioms. And we also might see, as I mentioned earlier, they might have difficulty with conversations um, and being able to have the give and take. How do I initiate a conversation? How do I maintain a conversation? How do I engage in the give and take of a conversation? And how do I end a conversation in a socially um, acceptable manner? So let's talk about some guiding principles for choosing treatments. Uh, we at the Center of Excellence focus on evidence-based practices. And what are evidence-based practices? Well, those are the types of interventions that have sufficient research um, that have been documented to have um, um, specific outcomes for individuals on the spectrum. So the research demonstrates that when this intervention is done with these types of individuals at this age, uh, it is effective and we have um, significant in impact using that intervention. And those evidence-based practice that are most e efficacious are those that impact the core, in the core symptoms of autism. And I'll speak in a moment further about it, but the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorder released a report uh, last year on um, evidence-based focus interventions. And this year, the National Standards Project released their report also on their review of the literature of what are the best practices uh, for individuals on the spectrum. One thing that the literature is really lacking is the determination of what are evidence-based practices for adults on the spectrum. We're getting better. The newest report goes up to 22 years of age. So the literature, the studies that have been done are now coming out more with um, the interventions that are effective for up to 22. But individuals with autism are older than that. And so one of our goals is to add to the body of research on effective interventions for adults through the lifespan. Um, because we, we wanna make sure that we are, uh, we never stop in our, in our mission to intervene and to make a out, um, positive outcome on the lives of individuals with autism. So we want to make sure that we choose interventions whose benefits clearly outweigh the risk. And we wanna assist the individual to acquire functional skills. And when we say functional skills, we want to make sure that what we're teaching, they're going to be able to use in real life. If, if, if we've been teaching the same thing for 15 years and that child is not understanding it, why, are we, why do we continue to teach it? Why are we teaching something that they're going to be able to use in their life to be independent, to be successful, to engage with others? Um, so we always have to keep that in mind um, that what we're teaching is functional for that child, for that family for the environment and for the culture that they are in. 
we also want to select therapeutic treatments that reduce the array of maladaptive behaviors. Because with these maladaptive behaviors come isolation, reduction of interaction with the social world, uh, reduction of success in independent living and in employment. So we, we have to focus on ensuring that we assist these individuals in being able to access the community and to live fulfilling and successful lives. We wanna make sure that we're treating the person and not the disorder. Every person is unique and they have distinct behavioral and learning profiles. We have to always emphasize what are the areas of, of strength. So if this individual is really great with technology, let's use technology as a tool for instruction. Yes, let's use technology as a way of motivating that individual to learn things that aren't as fun. If that individual is really great um, with music, let's use music as a, as a tool and as a vehicle for um, sharing knowledge with that individual. We wanna make sure that treatments are early and intensive and that they are not just multidisciplinary, but really interdisciplinary, where the professionals that are working with these individuals are communicating with each other. They're engaged with each other in sharing ideas, in sharing areas of expertise, and coordinating goals and objectives. Because if I work in isolation with this child and I don't collaborate with the speech pathologist, I'm not gaining knowledge of that expertise and we are not transferring knowledge for that child to different people and to different environments. So it's essential that we have a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach to intervention. And we need to make sure that we are engaging not only the child, but the parents, the school, and all others in the community that are involved with that individual. And whenever possible, engage the person with autism in asking them, their opinion about what interventions they want to participate in, what's working for them, what isn't working for them. Because if they are able to give their opinion, isn't that what's most important? Aren't they to be their own voice and their own advocates? Um, so some of, the, uh, some of the recommendations by the National Research Council include the early intervention, uh, using um, acquisition, generalization, and maintenance tasks, which we talked about. Make sure that the teaching environment has predictability and routines. When we have a predictable environment, we can learn more readily because we know what's expected. We know what's going to come. We have to make sure that we have appropriate accommodations and supports. So if the, if the student is in a regular education learning environment, or if the individual is in an employment, in a company and employed, how are we going to provide the appropriate supports and accommodations for that individual to be successful? Because we know that given the right accommodations and supports, most individuals can be successful at the tasks that are appropriate for them. And the only way we do this also is by our next point, is to have trained staff. We need to make sure that the educators in the school system are trained properly on best practices, on accommodations and supports, we need to make sure that we are in, um, training employers on what is autism, what are the strengths of people with autism, why are, they the, why are they great employees, and how can that employer help to maximize the potential of that individual in the work environment. We need to make sure that we are taking a functional approach to problem behavior. So we're not just looking at behavior and trying to modify the behavior, we're, what we're doing is determining what is the function of the behavior? Why is this behavior working for this person? Why are they doing it? Is it that they want something or are they trying to avoid something? And what skill are they lacking that's causing them to use this maladaptive behavior? And what can I teach them to replace that? So that really is the functional approach to problem behavior. And you'll learn more about that in Dr. Jessica Weber's um, lecture that will be coming up in a few weeks. And as I mentioned multiple times, involving the family is essential. And our, our colleagues in South Africa, uh, their model is really a parent coaching uh, model. And so the family is always involved um, as the facilitator of change. And here at the center um, in the US, we also have a um, primary goal of involving the family in all of the treatment um, that, we, that we are offering. 
So this is a list of some of the common autism intervention treatments. We know that um, applied behavior analysis has extensive research to, um, to demonstrate its effectiveness. The, the problem that I've found is that many people have misconceptions of what applied behavior analysis really is. And um, again, Dr. Jessica Weber will go further into it, but really ABA is a methodology of teaching. It's how we teach skills in a very discreet manner and utilize the principles of learning to reinforce those skills and to make them permanent change in that individual. Um, so some, some practices that use applied behavior analysis include discrete trial teaching, uh, the analysis of verbal behavior, and also pivotal, pivotal response training. Um, the TEACH system that comes out of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, is a structured teaching practice, but TEACH also utilizes the principles of applied behavior analysis as a teaching methodology. Um, then we have also developmentally based interventions such as floor time, also known as DIR, uh, relationship development intervention, and the CERTS model. And in my opinion, these developmental approaches actually use the principles of applied behavior analysis, but in a more laxed um, and non-discreet way. They still use reinforcement as a means of increasing the likelihood of behaviors occurring. It's done more in a naturalistic and developmentally uh, based approach. Um, but really to me, ABA is good teaching. Um, and that will leave for, for, another, for another webinar. Uh, some ancillary uh, rehab therapies that are uh, commonly seen for individuals with autism are speech and language therapy. I'm a special education teacher and a behavior analyst. I am not a speech and language therapist, so I must go to the speech therapist to consult on the natural progression of language. How does language develop? How does speech develop? What can I do to support this individual in gaining pragmatic skills? So it, we, we um, stand very firmly on that interdisciplinary approach in bringing all of the different uh, professionals together to share their areas of expertise. I may know how to work with individuals on some fine motor skills and on some gross motor skills, but I am not an occupational therapist. So therefore, I'm going to collaborate with the occupational therapist on best practices for fine motor skills. How can I help this individual to, uh, to do better with buttoning and writing and opening containers? How can I help this individual with their sensory processing? Uh, so although we might, we see these different disciplines, really the best approach is for these disciplines to work together in a collaborative, set, uh, collaborative manner. So as I mentioned to you, the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders released a uh, report, a report that can be found online if you, if you just do a web search for National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorder. You will see their full report and you can download it. And they um, came up with 27 focus interventions that have sufficient literature um, to warrant saying that they are effective in working with individuals with autism. Um, so this is, of, uh, this is a list of, of all of them. Uh, I, what I love is to see that technology-aided instruction is in, in there. Exercise was added. Uh, we at the, at the Center of Excellence at the Ellsborough Autism Foundation feel that sport and fitness is key to working with individuals with spectrum, um, um, with individuals on the spectrum. Um, and we have our Game on Autism Golf program that has been launched throughout the world. Um, in, in, in the effort to use exercise and sport as an intervention. Uh, we know that um, modeling and prompting are effective interventions. Um, some communication interventions are the picture exchange communication, also speech generated devices. Some of you may be familiar with uh, iPads um, or iPhones that have communication um, apps that the children can use to be able to click on the picture and the picture speaks for them. Um, so these are just a sampling of, of the different focus interventions that were provided in the report. Uh, what's really great about this report, when you go online and you look it up, 
is that they have all of the research studies that were collected to determine that this they were um, an evidence-based intervention, and they have a fact sheet that tells you exactly what is cognitive behavior intervention, what is prompting. And um, they also give you a link to modules on what's called the OCALI modules, the Autism Internet modules, that will also give you further instruction on the use of each of these um, focus-based interventions. And remember that in this little pod down here that says files too, you can download this presentation and you'll be able to get a copy of this slide um, for your future reference. Um, so lastly, let's talk about some other interventions that are, that are emerging. So sensory integration and a sensory diet has some evidence, but not sufficient to say that it is an evidence-based practice. The, the criteria that was used to include uh, these uh, previous interventions in the report included um, that they had to have at least five studies. The studies had to be from different people. They couldn't be from the same group or same person. And so it's not to say that these, um, these interventions that are on the left side of the screen here are not uh, effective. It's that they didn't fit the criteria um, to, to really be able to say that it's an evidence-based um, intervention. I can tell you as a music therapist, I know that music therapy works. And one thing that I um, am dedicated to doing is ensuring that the Center of Excellence conducts sufficient research to be able to, sh to add to the library of research studies in music therapy to really demonstrate its effectiveness for people on the spectrum. And then on, on the right-hand side, we see those interventions that do not have sufficient evidence at all um, and some actually could actually uh, cause harm to individuals. So we wanna make sure that we are engaging in interventions that at least have some research to be able to demonstrate their effectiveness. We want to really avoid those that do not have any research um, or that the research is only being done by that company um, and not by outside, uh, outside people. So I found this, uh, found this picture on the internet and I thought it was really nice. Um, autism is a spectrum. It's a spectrum of hopes, of dreams, abilities, feelings, desires, thoughts, and possibilities. And when we believe we can make a difference and when we believe that an individual with autism can succeed, they do succeed. And so I challenge all of you to make a difference in the lives of people with autism. And thank you so much for participating today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, but I will stay online for any questions um, or comments.